Courtney and I were on the phone last night talking about like how do we build community and when you new move to a new place or when you're traveling a lot like what what is community and I was thinking about our theme today it's create what you want to see and I have this idea that I want to share with you too and tell me what you think my friend just moved to the mountains and she wanted to get away from city life she's an interior decorator she created this beautiful cabin so that she could have her family come to her. And her definition of community, even though she's not in the same place with the people that she loves, it's having people come to her. And she had a family reunion with 60 people and she's creating it in her own way. For me, I've spent the last year going to people's houses for weeks at a time and just like inserting myself in their lives. And I went to Midati's, I think, three weeks out of this year. She's not on the podcast today. But I stayed with her, and I had the best time. I've gone to other countries and stayed with people I know. And to me, that's community. It's not like the people every day. And I've just been mulling this around. Like, yes, there's community around you, but then there's also the community that you create. And what do you all think about that? I think you're pretty spot on. I think it is about the community you create. Having lived on two other continents over my adult life, I've had to make my own community over and over again. It's quite hard sometimes if you're not um, willing to put yourself out there and look for those opportunities to find people to kind of enrich your life in a greater way. And if you don't do that, it can create a lot of loneliness, I think. It's interesting, though, because the two times that I've lived abroad, I found creating a community to be quite easy because you're around a lot Mm. of other people that need to do that as well. Moving back to the U.S. and to the Bay Area, it was a little bit more difficult because people already had their community set. So you were trying to look for those opportunities to insert yourself into pre-established communities in a way. So I think it differs depending on what point you're at in your life. Do you have kids? Are you married? Are you single? All of those factors play into what kind of community you build, how you build it, how strong it can become. But it's so important in life, right, to build those groups. So I've lived in LA for about seven years. It's been an ongoing struggle since I've lived here. Yes, I've I obviously have friends that I love um, and I've had a great time. But what I noticed is that there's a really big difference between hanging out with people and just having fun moments and passing time versus having really fruit, fruitful conversations and connections with people that change your life. Crystal, what does community mean to you? Like, I think you brought in an interesting point. Like, it depends on where you are in your life, like what you want, what you need. Courtney's at a place where she like wants this depth. Maybe now in your where you are in your life today, what does community mean? I think for me, community isn't necessarily about an everyday community. It's more about knowing that you've got people to rely on at any point in time. Those are the people that I think remain in your life for a really long time and they build what I would call, I guess, a lifelong community, right? And then you've got these other little communities that you build throughout different points in your life, whether they be a community that's within your career or for me, I have a daughter. So, you know, I have a community of other parents that are going through the same struggles that we're going through based on their children's age or the grade that they're in. So I think community means a lot of things and it's, it's almost like a tiered effect throughout your life that you create. Yeah. I love that. I mean, we could probably talk a formal episode on this. Probably. It's so needed. And you see, I don't know if you guys have seen all the stats about loneliness and the different generations experiencing more loneliness than we've ever seen before. And I wanted to bring that into this conversation because we are talking about the power of creating something and it can go as it can be huge and visionary or it can be something as little as like 
someone to go have a cup of coffee with. Like yeah. you can, but you can create it. My name is Crystal Solarzano. I am a principal with an architectural firm called 10 SB. I was born in California, in Southern California, in Fullerton, actually, and then moved to the Inland Empire quite young. My father's side is Mexican. My grandparents came to California from Mexico in their early 20s. So my father was first generation. And then on my mom's side, they're European. Part of them like to say they're Scottish. The other part say they're Irish. But it was interesting growing up with half of your family speaking a lot of Spanish and the other half not. But I also kind of grew up in a time where you didn't want to speak Spanish or you were kind of, it wasn't like something that was super popular. So I actually didn't grow up speaking it a lot, just hearing it a lot. And then I guess in terms of the hats that I wear, I'm a mother of a wonderful seven-year-old, a little girl, and I'm a wife to a man who is also, he's in the architectural practice. We actually work together. We've worked together our entire careers, um, which is a whole nother podcast in itself, probably. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I already um, want to know more. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I lead business development and marketing for our firm globally. So I do a lot of traveling. I like to think of myself also as a therapist sometimes. I have to listen to a lot of our team, you know, problems they might be having, things that are going on on projects, a whole number of issues that come up throughout the life of any work. I like to think of myself as a creator. I create connections. I create content. I create opportunities. And we were talking about before, I look for ways to create new avenues and new roadmaps for not just myself, but also for my team. That's awesome. You you do wear a lot of hats. <laughs> <laughs> you wear a lot of hats. You uh, Okay, well, before we get into the rule that you broke, just give us a little Reader's Digest on what is it like to work with your husband? <laughs> okay, I didn't know this was going to come up. <laughs> Dying to know. I, got, I must know. And you said you, your whole careers. Like, that's what yeah. caught my ear. You were like, yeah, our whole careers. We met at work and got married and then... We were both still working for the same firm when we moved to Singapore together, spent six years living there and working there. And then he was offered a job with our current firm here in the Bay Area. So we moved back in 2017 and I went to work for a small boutique interior design firm for a year. And then I got a call from the president of our firm, SB Architects, and he offered me the head of business development, and I came back over to work with him again. And so here I am. We've been, yeah, married for 13 years and working together for 17. So it's been a long time. What is it wow. like working with him, <laughs> though? Um, I think because he's still, he's on the architecture side, he's in the projects, and I work on the front end of when we're chasing the work. We don't necessarily overlap a lot, except for when I'm working with him on a pursuit. Um, and then sometimes it could get a bit interesting, I guess, when it comes to conversations about should we pursue it or shouldn't we? For the most part, I think we're just both very supportive of each other's careers. So we understand each other's careers really well. We both have to travel a lot, which can be difficult having a child and even maintaining a strong relationship. So the fact that we both give each other a lot of grace when it comes to what you're able to contribute to, you know, the household or the day to day in terms of how that balances with work when we are in such a kind of high speed, you know, lots of things going on at the same time. I, I think it's actually quite helpful. I think if you don't have a partner that understands that, it can be really hard. I worked for two married couples. Like when they're the bosses, I don't I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I like for Crystal, like you, you guys are like separate and together. So it's not like you're making every single daily decision for the business yeah. Yeah. together. You both have your own worlds, but you know who you're talking about and you understand. I think that that part sounds kind of fun. 
It can definitely, I mean, it it has its points where you can sometimes slip over a line where, you know, I might say something to him in a way that I wouldn't say it to somebody else, right? Because I feel like Mm -hmm. I'll be forgiven a lot easier. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. (laughs) That's so fun. Okay. So, I mean, that's really cool. You know, on this podcast, we've heard... There's so many successful women who we've interviewed, and I think, like, there's definitely been a theme of having true partners in crime, like just sharing the load, sharing the responsibilities, coming from a place of understanding. And I I think it's really awesome to see these, like, powerful women like yourself who also have powerful partners. I mean, we are breaking the rules here, and there are a lot of women who have to have that support in order to be successful and do what you're doing, like moving to another country and all these things. Like, it has has to be a partnership. Yeah. And, I mean, to the point about moving to another country, and, and maybe I'm getting ahead of the conversation, but When we decided, we had only been married for maybe four months, and I had taken a trip to Singapore and come back and said, we have to move. I love it there. We have to move. And he had never been. And so he said, well, he's he's more of the type to sit and think about things and, you know, evaluate and understand. And he probably would have wanted to take a trip out there first. And within an hour or so, he caught me on the computer and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm selling the car. We, we're not taking it with us. <laughs> and he's like, no, I haven't said that we're going. I haven't said that I want to go. Oh, we're oh, going. Like we're is. going. And then eight months later, we got on a plane or actually he got on a plane. I got stuck on a project still in California. And so I sent him on to Singapore on his own, having never been there. And he happened to land on the hottest day of the year. And I remember calling him you know, via FaceTime and him looking at me like, what did you get me into? That sounds like a rule that you broke. What is it? Ask now, for, ask uh, for forgiveness later. So what? Yeah, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. You like moved your whole family to another country. That's hilarious. At the time, it was just he and him and I. And so it was, you know, we had no real tangible responsibilities. We didn't have any kids. We didn't have a mortgage. There was nothing tying us down. And so why not? Um, And it was, yeah, it was the best decision I think we could have made for both of us. Okay. So I have a question asking for a friend. I'm the friend. How old were you when you made that decision? I was 28. When we decided, oh my to gosh, make chill. Yeah. Courtney's don't, 28. Don't are you 28? Don't look at me like that. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. It's time to make a move. It was that was my second stint abroad, and my first one. I was in my. I was 20, and I moved down to South America for a year and a half, going through my own kind of what I would call maybe a quarter life existential crisis. Um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my career. That, again, was another pivotal po- point in my life where if I hadn't moved down there, I probably wouldn't have ended up in architecture. I wouldn't en- have ended up in design. And I think all of those moments, those decisions to take on something that feels kind of scary and challenging. You know, I moved by myself when I was in my 20s. And then to move with somebody, you know, you were just newly married. It was exciting, but also like what's going to happen. This is a big thing to go through together so early on in in, uh, a relationship. So So when we think about like creating what you want to see, what did you want to see? You know, when we moved to Singapore, it had a lot to do with we were working in a firm that had lots of offices. I think there were six or seven at the time. And it gave us the opportunity to see other places and experience other cultures, but also the opportunity to potentially move somewhere else. And so this opportunity presented a lot of growth because it was a newer office. We knew that there would be more leadership um, opportunities for both of us there. We were both at points in our career where we needed to make a little bit of a change and we needed to kind of shake things up. But we didn't want to leave the firm that we were with. So this was a a way for us to stay with them, but then still find some more growth moving forward. So 
you moved to Singapore to advance your career. In 2011. That was 2011. Yeah. I'm curious. Like, that's a really big move. What advice would you give to someone who's wanting to make a leap this large? Because I think we, we talk a lot about transitioning maybe within companies or within industries, but like, I think it's important to talk about what does it mean when you're making a physical move for your career? It's not advice necessarily, but it's more of a question, yeah. right? I think I might have asked my husband the same question when he was trying to kind of walk through all of this. And it was like, what's the worst that can happen? We move back. That's the worst. But in the end, we had agreed to a four-year contract and we stayed for six. So I think that if you don't do it, if you don't try it, you'll regret it at some point. You know, if you had that opportunity, you let it go by for good reason, some kind of life event or some other opportunity presented itself that forced you to stay physically where you were at, then that's something else. But if there's nothing really standing in your way, then I think you just have to jump in both feet first and take in every experience that it brings. Because I honestly feel like those the two moves, the two international moves to different places uh, that I've made have has made me a much broader thinking person. And uh, I don't know that I would have that without the long term time in both of those locations. For some people, there's only so much time in your life where you're able to do it. So when I was in my early 20s, you know, I just pack, packed up and left. I did go to school down there, so I didn't just bum around South America. When I was 28 and we moved to Singapore, you know, it was for work, but it was also about experiencing this other place. You know, how often do you get the chance to go live in Asia for X number of years, however long you end up there? But yeah, I think that you just have to do it. And I've made, I made some of my closest friends in Singapore. Some of my like long-term community was made in Singapore. How did you create it while you were there? <clears throat> Back to our theme, like create what you want to see. How did you build that? Singapore is an interesting place because it's a little bit transient. There are, you know, a lot of expats there constantly moving in and moving out. A lot of people say, oh, if you're there for longer than seven years, you're probably there for life. But uh, a lot of people come in for, you know, two years, four years, and then they, they head back either to where they are originally from or on to a new location. And so you pretty quickly figure out, like, is this somebody I want to spend time with and, and invest myself in? Luckily for me and my husband, we were able to meet a number of people that we did want to, you know, invest ourselves in, in terms of long-term friendships. And they've remained, you know, our friends now that we've all dispersed into different corners of the globe. We still talk on a regular basis, rely on each other. So I think that both in that instance, a lot of the community that we created were actually people within our industry, too. I think architects, for some reason, tend to, like, gravitate toward. There's some magnet. It's like they understand <laughs> each other. So we have a lot of friends in the same industry that we're in. Crystal, you travel a lot for work. Is that by choice or is that the nature of the job? Can you just tell us more about what that looks like? Yeah, I guess it's probably a little bit of both. Pre-pandemic, we were all on planes quite a bit. All of the design leadership, uh, myself included. It's better to have a face-to-face -face with the client and talk through something and create that relationship and help them understand that you really do care about their project. It's not just another project. You know, another thing to note just in terms of the type of work our firm does is we predominantly focus on the hospitality space and hospitality is all about people. So I think being with them and understanding their goals and their vision in person and talking it through is super important. You know, during the pandemic, we had to do a lot of that over Zoom and that was never quite as 
impactful as being there with them. The other thing is finding new clients is really difficult to do over Zoom and just over the phone because there's something about that interaction in person that creates a a stronger bond. And even outside of the clients, creating bonds with your colleagues that are overseas so that they know who they're relying on and what kind of person you are, having those conversations that are in a coffee shop or at lunch or out at happy hour after work, those are, those conversations almost become more important than the ones that you have during a scheduled meeting because more comes out of it um, and you can have deeper conversations than you can at other times. So a big part of why I think traveling to these places and being with these people in person, I think it's important because that's where you create the long-standing relationships that will bring more work. It brings trust. And I mean, the word that keeps coming up, it brings community within everything that we do. I love that at the beginning of this conversation, when you were describing all your hats, you said you were a creator. And that's what we keep hearing. You create you create everything. You create the connection. You create trust. You create community. You create plans for people. Like you I, really to be for do. the record, I don't create the plans. If somebody asked oh, me to create I, I, the plans, I didn't mean um, the, the I didn't building mean the would fall down. Plans. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean the architectural plans. I meant like the vision. <laughs> like this is what we're gonna do. I forgot who I was talking to for a second. <laughs> yeah, not I, architectural. You don't create the blueprints. <laughs> yeah, I always laugh when clients say, "So, are you going to be working on the project?" I'm like, "You do not want that." Trust me, I will find somebody really good, but it's not me. When you're walking into these rooms, is it male dominated? Is it 50 50 men and women? Like, what's the demographic of the room? The AEC, so AEC is uh, architecture, engineering, and construction. The AEC industry is predominantly male still. It's Mm -hmm. changing every day. There are more women you know, in entering those fields, um, which is great to see, but it is still heavily male dominated. So, you know, depending on the region and the type of meeting it is, whether it's with a creative collaborator or a client team, I'd say a majority of the time I'm maybe the only woman or one of two or three in the room. Within our organization, I'm actually very proud to say we've got a number of very strong females in leadership roles across the firm. So I think as an organization, we've done a great job at identifying how we continue to move women up. But yeah, sometimes it can be a little daunting walking in and being the only woman. So typically when most of us think of being the quote only in a room, it's seen as a weakness or a disadvantage. But I'm curious for you, how is that actually an advantage and a superpower. I think sometimes being the only woman in the room, you have an opportunity to make yourself heard more in a way. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're there and you're in the room and you're part of the conversation, people will listen. You don't have to come in and be forceful just because you're a woman. You need to come in and I think the way women utilize kind of their empathetic and emotional strengths in a conversation helps people connect with them, if that makes sense. I liked how you started <laughs> saying, um, just because you're in a room full of men, you don't doesn't mean you have to be aggressive. You know, women bring a level of empathy and emotional intelligence to conversations that allow you to connect with the people sitting around the table in ways that maybe sometimes men can't. Not to say that they don't, but I think that there's just something different about the way a woman speaks to others and a way that we deliver certain information. And I think if you can harness that superpower, which I think all women have, you will be heard and you might be heard even more than the rest of the people in the room. As you were talking, the thought that kept going through my head was, I just love us. 
<laughs> I love us. <laughs> Women are amazing. Over my career, most of my mentors have actually been men. And I've had a couple of females in my career that I've had a lot of respect for and and watched how they navigated certain situations. But for some reason, I've always been drawn to this idea of kind of watching how male leadership is different from female leadership, but how in some ways you can learn from both sides and take the best parts of both of them and make them your own. And so I feel really lucky because I've had, you know, some very collaborative and supportive males in my life, both on a professional and personal side, that have helped me navigate certain career moves, changes in my life, even, you know, moving abroad and changing paths in university to study something else. So I think it's important to just talk a little bit about the fact that it's not necessarily for me about being the only woman in the room and how that creates a strength, but it's also about understanding that regardless of sexual orientation, ethnicity, background, socioeconomic level, everybody brings some strength and interest and perspective to the table. And if you're not willing to sit and listen, then I don't think that you're able to, I don't think that you're able to harness the full capacity of the community that you're in. I mean, it really is. I'm just going to keep saying it over and over. It it still comes back to creating. And it's like, if you're going to create the life that you want, if you're going to create the decisions, like, don't just limit your, don't limit yourself to the types of people that you have in the room with you, the types of people who you invite into the room, yeah. the types of people you invite into your life. Because the cool thing about being that creator is you can pick and choose. So you can say, you know, I think I'm going to take a little bit from this guy. It's like making a recipe. I'm going to take a little bit of this. I'm going to take a little bit of this. I want a variety of voices. And in this context for my career, I want to hear all those voices. And I also know in the process, my voice is a key ingredient as well. And so that's something that I hear you saying, Crystal, is like, yes, I'm here. I bring my own flavor <laughs> to, <laughs> to the table. Um, but I am also mindful and aware of the other perspectives that are going to help make this great. Yeah, that 100%. That's exactly it. One thing I would like to share with our listeners is that if you're listening and you want to make a move, take Crystal's life experience <laughs> of just doing it and going for it and think about maybe in your life, like, where are you holding back? Where are you waiting for someone else? Where can you just jump in? Where can you move forward and ask for permission later? And then who are the people that you can bring along this ride? Like, it, Crystal's had a really fun journey. And I'm sure it's there's, you know, ups and downs. But she's really shown us today that you can go for it. And it's worth trying. It's worth moving. It's worth creating what you want to see. And you really have the power to create all the elements that are going to be a part of it. And what you might find is that it might work. You might actually like it. You might advance in your career. You might want to stay at a new place longer. You might build great relationships with people over the long haul. And you might be successful in the meantime. Like there's a lot of really cool what ifs here. So I would say, think about those what ifs. And I hope that today from, from Crystal's story that you would take your own leaps and whatever that means for you. Hey, What Rules listeners, we are going to take a break for the summer. During this time, catch up on our episodes and keep up with us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Enjoy your summer, and we'll see you in September. 
Want more advice on how to break the rules and outsmart the game to advance your career? Check us out on Instagram, YouTube, and our website, whatrulespodcast.com for more insight from our guests and hosts and join our community on LinkedIn where we discuss rule-breaking strategies for multicultural women. What Rules is a project of Zara Consulting and is supported by the amazing team at Stories Bureau. This episode was produced by Alexandra Uresta with editing and music supervision by Joshua Ramsey and was engineered and mixed by Tim Ballant. Our podcast cover was designed by Delion Creative. Visit whatrulespodcast.com for more info, upcoming events, and all episodes of What Rules, including video, and make sure to give us a follow.